Terry. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing, Sam? Great. It's a beautiful day here in Natick, Massachusetts. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so uh, how's your friend doing here? He's doing well. This is uh, glad you mentioned that. This is actually what we're going to be talking about today, and this is where we're going to really end up. It's a robot, will. right? It's a robot. It's a Six Degree of Freedom robot. It's got a little hand here and various joints. So what makes it move? What do we got here? These are motors. They're actually DC motors. They're servo motors that were modified, by actually ripping out the little servo circuit. And they're just DC motors where we get feedback from the potentiometer that's inside there, so we get analog voltage proportional to position. So what's your blue box right here? This is where the controller is running. The controller was designed in Simulink. Okay, so the control is basically, I, I believe, going to control voltages on these DC motors. Absolutely. You got probably an H bridge right here. A, a few of them. Yep. Okay. And, and the, you'll do. Pulse width modulation, right? Absolutely. Pulse width modulation. So the robot's connected to this interface box where the power electronics are. That box is connected through these cables to the, the uh, connectors for the I.O. boards in our real-time machine, which, by the way, is not running m Windows for sure. It's not even running MATLAB. It's not running DOS. It's running a real-time operating system called XPC Target. So that means it's kind of synchronizing the calculation, the control, with real-time deterministic real time every sample time is at a deterministic specified time yes. okay and yeah you know, since the robots hardware it's got no choice but to run in real time that's a good point terry yeah uh, okay very cool <laughs> uh let's see and uh i guess you mentioned potentiometer and that that's kind of the uh the feedback loop we've said. right right so this is where we're going to end up but what we really want to show today is what we call model-based design what does that mean to you terry model-based design? well i think it means you're using models maybe first before you do hardware that's absolutely design through simulation okay where we can early in the design process do try lots of iterations lots of what ifs optimize the design before we ever get to you know bending metal and and uh, you know, putting electricity on things. Exactly. I couldn't say it any better, but I'm going to throw in one more comment. Okay. Okay. To me, models are about that they are fast, they are inexpensive, and they are early. And it means that you can get started with your simulations, get great information very early in the development process. Absolutely. Another great advantage, too, is through the environment of MATLAB and Simulink, it's a great collaborative environment. Yeah, I was going to ask you. I, I bet, you know, for systems like this, you know, obviously mechanical engineers. Right. Uh, electrical, electrical engineers when it comes to the motors. Control, software engineers. Uh huh. Testing engineers. Exactly. That's what I used to do. So, and other domains as well. Of course, we don't have hydraulics or pneumatics here, but we support uh, lots of other domains as well. Yeah, that's great. And basically, one can consistent environment for that entire workflow. Exactly. All right. Well, very cool. You ready to get started? Let's do it. All right. Very good. All right. Fun stuff. Robots. Uh, so, Terry, where, where do we start? So, uh, you know, there's basically there's the software and there's a the hardware. I'd say let's start with the hardware. Good okay. controls, real good software is designed for the hardware it's going to control. All right. right. Hardware. Okay. Hardware. It's a mechanical, electrical system. You know, for a number of preferences, I'd say choose mechanics first. It looks like that's what you got up on the screen here. Yeah, what do you think of this? This is really pretty cool, isn't it? It's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. All right, this is a CAD tool, right? And it's more than just a picture. This is the design of this mechanism. Those part geometries are perfect because they're perfect. They imply all the masses and inertias and all the really important properties of this robot. So is this one of the MathWorks toolboxes? Uh, no, this is a tool called SolidWorks, all right? And there's a number of really important CAD tools out there like SolidWorks, and this is one of them that we work with. Okay, so basically since we don't, the MathWorks doesn't make a CAD tool, we integrate with CAD tools. We can, we can, uh, you can export from CAD and import that into, into exactly. MATLAB and Simulink. Exactly, so since you brought it up, let me show you the import. Okay, so you recognize this, don't you, Sam? Well, only because I've seen it before, and this is the model that you d um, that you exported from the, the CAD you were just showing us, and then imported it directly into Simulink through uh, Sim Mechanics. That's exactly it, right? And so this is a live simulation, first time it's calculating this, right? And that's is this actually calculating the 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for the um, the di the dynamics the um, it's the mechanical dynamics of this linkage. Yeah. Okay. It's applying a very classic rigid body dynamics approach to do this. Kinematics would that be the right term? No, this is dynamics because uh, okay. kinematics. Uh, what I call you know dynamics is F equals M A. Right. Kinematics is about A. It's not about F. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, and there is an F, right? And it's gravity. And so by default, we have gravity just acting That's in this, why it's this vertical right direction. Now. That's the only reason it's moving. Uh, okay. You know what else is going on here? That is a perpetual motion machine as is right now. All the joints are perfect, no friction, no electric motors, no nothing. 
Okay, so since those don't exist, and our robot certainly isn't one, this is uh, this is really just a starting point. This is getting the CAD, the mechanical aspect That's in. That's the perfect way to say yeah. it. I sometimes joke, you know, that this is beautiful, but it's completely wrong, of course. <laughs> it's not completely wrong. What it is is incomplete at this point. Yes. But what we got with Sim Mechanics is that it's done the really hard part for us. Okay, and the reality of the system will be added as we put in electric motors, put in controls, we characterize those motors for their electrical response as well as you know things like friction and damping too. So before we go into the details of how we do each one of those things you just said, can you just kind of show us kind of the, the finished model that has all that already added in? I happen to have one, so I'm going to bring that up right now, Sam. So here we are, Sam. This is a finished model. Does this look familiar? It does. Actually, this looks like a, a controls diagram. It does. It's a block diagram. That's the you know really natural environment for controls engineers, and it's really the way that you quite often will define models in Simulink. So, what about the um, the imported model you were just showing us? Is that contained in that model somewhere? Absolutely. So, check this out. Okay, what's uh, you know what's different about this one? Well, it's not just flopping all over the place now. Yeah, you know, it's moving in a very coordinated, orchestrated way, and that's because we've got controls involved now. Yeah. Okay, and this is a model where we're modeling the electric motors with controls or controlling voltage on those motors, as ultimately defined by our command signal, which is shown right, shown right here. Okay, it's gorgeous, Sam. All right, so I want to uh, kind of show you something I think is real cool, too. Look at that. Is that the uh, commanded versus feedback for each of the six degrees of freedom? Exactly. There are six degrees of freedom. If you look close, you'll kind of see a blue line, and, you'll, and that's our command signal. Yep. And you'll see a red line. That's kind of how we're doing. So it looks pretty good, doesn't it? It does. Okay. Well. It doesn't look perfect, though. And it's not perfect. And I am going to kind of show that by showing one of these in a more kind of magnified uh, light. And now, you know, what do you think of that, Sam? Is that good? Is that good enough? You know? <laughs> well, I guess it all depends on what the requirements are. Exactly. And it always is that way when you're doing engineering. And, you know, these controls engineers that we work with, they've gotten very good at kind of characterizing what's good through things like overshoot, you know, rise time, settling time, things like that. Okay. And those are requirements. You know, obviously this one, our command signal, changes velocity. You know, this is angle versus time. We got a discontinuity there. That's infinite acceleration. Yeah, a real motor can't do that. A real motor can't do that. Okay. And what I really like about, you know, kind of simulating for this kind of work is that if you dive into these things, you realize there's the mechanics like we got from SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. There's also the electric motors. Nice. And then ultimately you get controls in there too. So one environment for the electrical parts, the mechanical parts, and the controls. Model-based design. Model-based design. To reach those top-level requirements, you know, you have to have every domain represented in your simulation. Design through simulation. Okay. So the key pieces, you know, for this, and this is really what the rest of the seminar is about, is really kind of putting, adding to the mechanics the pieces that make this real, and it begins with the electric motor. All right. Good. So we'll go off, let's design our, our electric motor models, and then we'll design controls, and ultimately you're going to show us how to implement it on real hardware. Let's do it. All right, great. Let's go to PowerPoint. Uh, I'd really like to make sure we got our definition of a DC motor, and then we'll go and use this as the basis of our model. All right, so here's a DC motor. It's got a voltage source right there, and it basically drives current through a resistor and inductor. And then we've got this magic thing happen where electric current essentially turns into torque that drives the mechanical shaft <laughs> yeah. to a shaft velocity. That is the essence of the motor, the <laughs> magical thing. Yeah. And it is magic, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so we've got basically two key state variables, the shaft velocity of you know, our shaft here and then the, uh, the current passing through the circuit. All right, Professor Dennery, tell us how this works. Okay, so I'm going to do a mouse click, all right? Just make sure we're aware. There's some key parameters, resistance, inductance, inertia, torque constant, also the back EMF constant, and an applied voltage to kind of drive everything. All right, another click. Kirchhoff really helps us out, all right? Voltage balance throughout the circuit gives us our differential equation on current. 
Let's do an additional mouse click while I identify uh, the first order derivative for current. Dr. D whipping out the differential equations. <laughs> yes. All right. And uh, let's do another quick, a second very important differential equation. Uh, there's this guy named Newton came up with something called F equals MA and expressed rotationally. It's essentially rotational acceleration, one over the inertia times the electromagnetic torque. Okay. I can follow that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two kind of mysterious variables here. VEMF is the back EMF voltage. Uh, it's defined equal to K times omega. That's our torque or back EMF constant. All right. And then electromagnetic torque, very coincidentally, but actually pretty obvious if you kind of do the math, is equal to K times I. All right. And so anyways, this is what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and close PowerPoint. Let's get back to MATLAB. All right. Let's bring up Simulink. Uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and clear my workspace. So, Sam, what do you think of the uh, new MATLAB? I like it a lot. I think it's super cool myself. Definitely. Uh, but you know what I like best about it? It's the same old MATLAB. You know, <laughs> it still will not let me down. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to Simulink, and uh, let's open up a model. Ah, so you're starting with a blank sheet of paper here, huh? This is a blank sheet. All right, let's go get some very useful blocks. I'll get the constant and move this over so I don't have to keep on going back and forth. Let's get a gain. All right. We'll get an integrator, a scope. All right. And then under math operations, I'm going to get an add block. All right. And with these five blocks, we will create a DC motor. And so I'm going to begin with a very simple simulation. I'm going to send a constant source into my scope. Okay, double click on that. And you know, I basically see my scope is modeled after an oscilloscope. Time is my horizontal axis. Signal value is the vertical. Okay, we're sending in a constant. We get a horizontal line. Okay, now if I throw an integrator on here, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Mm. Well, let's hit the run button and find out. It's going to integrate with respect to time. And therefore, it's going to be a constant slope inclined line. So Simulink inherently has the concept of numerical integration. It's exactly what it is. You know, and so, um, you know, all that Runga Kutta stuff, it's all happening behind the scenes, uh -huh, you know, very uh -huh. automatically. I do know that Runga Kutta stuff. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> all right, so now I'm going to introduce a gain. Notice my gain I'm going to choose is a value of 2. It right, means it's going to take in this incoming signal and multiply it by 2. All right, so instead of going from 0 to 10 in 10 seconds, you'll see that we now make it to 20. So that's slope hey, what if you drop another integrator on there? Could you get a parabola? Let's, let's just try it out and find out. All it's right. easy to do in simulation. Yeah, all you do you know, is hit this run button, and boom, there nice. you go. All right, so basically that easily we just solved a second-order differential equation. Nice. All right, it may have looked like I was kind of playing around, but you know, this is pretty relevant what I did. Oh. You want to see one of my favorite features of uh, new Simulink? <laughs> <laughs> I can go to the left side. All right, anyways, yeah. let's get back here. <laughs> All right, and uh, yeah, so anyways, it may have looked like I was playing around a little bit, but this is very important. Well, seemingly it kind of feels like playing to me. That's why I like it so much. Okay, and so if you think about mechanics, and if you make, let's say, an observation that you know, kind of this signal right here is like velocity, I'll just call it VEL, all right? Well, velocity going into an integrator, you know, what should be coming out? If you're entering velocity, you got position. Exactly. So Rectilinear kind of motion. Position. And so velocity is coming out of an integrator, too. So before here. Acceleration. Exactly. All right. All right. And I'm going to do one more. Okay. Now we're doing rotational stuff. All right. And so if I make that I for inertia. I for inertia? Yeah, I know. I know you guys like to call it J. But okay. Sam, <laughs> all, I, all I can say, it's not pronounced inertia. Okay. <laughs> I'll let it slide. All right, so anyways, obviously torque, right? And we've basically expressed probably the key, you know, equation of mechanics. Ah, so you're meaning in the rotational form for a DC motor. Exactly. Uh, so you. anyways, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just kind of copy this part right here. And we're essentially done with our mechanics right now. Now I'm going to come in here. Instead of that being I, I'm going to make it, actually that should be 1 divided by I. I'll have to fix that in a second. Right, one divided by L. L, ah, uh, linductance. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes sense to me. That's all I can say, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's click on OK. All right, so uh, linductance right here. <laughs> so if this is voltage, this should be DIDT, right? 
Yep. Okay. DIDT going into an integrator. All right. I. Okay. Going Got into it. the second integrator. Yeah, maybe we're interested in this charge. Okay. And if there is a charge, you know, maybe there's a battery, and maybe we do need to set an initial condition. But let's not worry about it, and let's not worry about charge either. I love Simulink. It's pretty cool. All right. So let's uh, kind of send that in there, and let's kind of work on, you know, kind of this electrical part still. And you might recall that little equation we put together. The Kirchhoff's equation? Yeah, that we basically got kind of a grouping. It's like the sum of the volt voltages around a circuit, right? Exactly. And it's essentially the voltage that's going to be felt by that inductor. All right, and there were three components, and uh, you know, two of them were negatives, or were being subtracted off, and only one of them was additive. All right? And so uh, I'll just kind of quickly change my add block into a minus plus minus. I'm going to allow this constant to be my applied voltage, and so let's get the resistive voltage drop, okay, which we know to be proportional to current. And so we'll just kind of drag it in like that. Yeah, I'm not so sure I like that choice by new Simulink, but for the most part, it's pretty good, Sam. All right, and so, uh, so resistive voltage drop, we need to introduce an important parameter called the resistance. Mm. I like okay. how it flipped the game when you dropped it. That was cool. I know. It is cool. All right, so let's uh, come this way, and we got this thing called back EMF voltage. It's pretty important, too. Right, and so I'm going to just kind of move this oh, around ooh, a nice. little bit. Nice. Let's move that up like that. And back EMF voltage has an important proportionality constant. That we K. Label K. Torque constant. All right. And then let's complete this by defining our electromagnetic torque. Okay, and so it'll be that electromagnetic torque that will operate on the inertia of the shaft. I know, that's proportional to a... To a uh to to um, I current. That's, a, that's exactly it, All right? And so, and you know what's really Not cool? Inertia. It's that same K. Right, right, All right. And with that, we basically have just defined an electromag. Uh, well, basically a, a DC motor. All right. And so, I think it's a good idea. You know, coming out of this integrator will be our shaft velocity. I don't know, Terry. You made it look too easy. I don't. I don't think it's going to work. Really? I don't. Well, let's hit the run button. <laughs> yeah, of course it's not going to work. All right. So obviously, we just don't uh, expect Simulink to, you know, um, choose for us what resistance, inductance, and so forth should be. So each of these kind of uh, undefined choices. Undefined function or variable, it says. Okay. All right. So they need their assignment. All right. Let's kind of open that up again. And where do you think we get these values from? MATLAB. Exactly. Certainly, you got lots and lots of options. Uh, I like MATLAB, All right, and I'm going to just kind of go to my history and kind of uh, find a time when I've done this demo before. It was a while ago. Boy, it sure does seem like a long time ago, Sam. You can search that, you know. Yeah. Oh, can you? Yeah, you can search right. Control F. Get yeah. you to show me that sometime. All right. All right, so anyways, I'll uh, just kind of choose these values. Notice they're all equal to 1. Notice as I hit 1, it enters them into my MATLAB workspace, and... Then let's kind of get back here. Okay. And I'll hit run. Okay. And there's Boom. your DC motor. Okay. So uh, what do you think of that, Sam? That's a DC motor right there for you. Looks like it's uh, kind of leveled out to a steady state speed there. Yeah. So what do you think about all those values being equal to 1? I think you just made those up. I did make them up. And, uh, you know, one of the important things you do to help me out is tell me what those values should be. So can you show us how we can get those. Let's do it. So Sam, did you get that uh, model I just emailed you? Absolutely, I did. In fact, I've got it right here on my screen. Sam, uh, that doesn't look like my model. What happened to well, all those loops and gains and <laughs> integrators and stuff? You're right, it doesn't. So what I did is I put it inside of a subsystem, and a subsystem is just a way to organize your model. So you can see if I go down here, I can actually open your model. Oh, wow, you got more than just my model there. I've got four models here, all right? And this one, if I look under the mask of this one, we'll see your model. Now, it's been rearranged a little bit. Sam, I can't believe you changed my I to a J. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that I would. Now, here's one of my favorite features of Simulink in 2012B is you got this breadcrumb, which makes it very easy to kind of navigate oh, through man, the... Uh, cool. Yeah, isn't that neat? Yeah. So 
Anyway, uh, so I put it inside a subsystem, and what the other thing I put in the subsystem, as you notice, there's four models, is I have uh, a hardware interface to the real motor. So did you notice what we have here that, that you can see in the video? We have the real motor. Oh, there's your real motor. Now, it's not in the robot. Right. So the idea is that the robot is our bigger system for in, in this context. And we've now broken that down into one subsystem, as you modeled, the DC motor. Yes. And now we've got the real DC motor. This, DC, this single DC motor right here is the same as the, the, um, the DC motors that are used on a robot. There's actually seven. There's six degrees of freedom, and well, one of the degrees has two motors. This compares much better to what I did, because I said the inertia was constant. You know, the robot, true. it's not, and that's why it's so inertia. hard, and that's why sim mechanics is so useful. Yep, yep, absolutely. So so let me do two things. First, let me run your model with kind of the default made-up values. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit the play button. Boom, all right? And let me kind of zoom out on that scope. Yeah, and, why, why? and this is the result from running the simulation um, of your model with this input source. All right, so this is the voltage input source. This is the, the test signal, if you will, the test harness, I like to call it. All right, this is the input that we gave uh, the model of the motor. So this is uh, some small ramps and voltages as well as some larger steps and voltages. So what's with the, uh, the small ramps at the beginning? Well, we're trying to characterize this motor. In this simple demo we're doing here today, uh, we're just using one set of data, but typically you'd have many, many sets of data where you're trying to maybe capture various aspects so of the dynamics. So I bet those small ramps are a very good way to really kind of look for that threshold where that static friction's going to Yeah, break. exactly, because if you look at if you, this motor here, it may be hard to tell in the video, but it's actually quite difficult to turn. There's some little plastic gears in there. and Yeah, it's you can kind of feel the static friction, can't you? Yeah, there's quite a bit there actually. Okay, and so then those big steps, you know, that's a very traditional thing to do in identifying, uh, you know, hardware components, essentially a step response you're going to get from that. Yeah, and all that you can see we kind of reach the steady state speed, kind of the no load speed of the motor, if you will, because yeah. this is a position versus time plot. Yep, that's where you actually that back EMF voltage builds up so much that you actually balance the the uh, voltage in the circuit. Exactly. Now that's the results from the simulation. I've, like I said, have a few different variations inside this subsystem. It's actually called a subsystem variant. So you're going to show us how to connect to that hardware? You just did it? Well, I just switched over. I'm not showing exactly how I built that. Maybe we'll get to that in a few minutes. But right now I'm just switching to a hardware interface for that motor. So basically there's like hardware drivers and things like that. That, exactly. that you'll interface directly with. And this model is going to run in real time on our real time system, like we showed in the beginning with the robot. It's now connected to that DC motor. And I'm going to, so I'm therefore going to take this model, I'm going to change it from normal mode to external mode, which I consider like online mode. In other words, once I click this new button that pops up called connect to target and we're connected, anything I do in the model, press play, change But that's input, basically running on your blue box again. It's running externally, external mode, it's running externally on the other machine, the real time machine. So I'm going to go ahead and click play, and as I do, you'll see things go by in the scope, but more importantly, let's look at the real motor. Okay, you see it moving back and forth. There's a little red light blinking there, you might notice, because you have to have a red light blinking when you do a hardware Sam, test. Sam, that's, that's gorgeous. It's you know, just like running Simulink when it's all simulation, but now some of those sources are actually coming from real hardware. Exactly. So we log data on the real-time machine. Essentially, it's our data acquisition system. And this data really could come from any data acquisition system. Here I'm using XPC Target, our real-time environment for an acquisition system. I downloaded that data. This is a shortcut to some MATLAB commands. And I'm going to plot the, different, the, the two plots out. What are the two plots? Well, the blue line is the result from the simulation, the first thing that I showed. All right, That's the results of that, that test vector, that, that series of ramps and steps and voltage through your model of the motor with the default parameters that you made up, as well as that same input, stimulus response test. It's all open loop, right? Yes. We're just giving it that stimulus and measuring the response, and the red dash line is the results from the real motor. It's measured data from the real motor that we just acquired just now. Cool. So it looks like kind of the, the appropriate character is there, but the scaling is way off. Exactly. So right. we really need to kind of tune the knobs of those parameters until we get the output of the model to match the real and motor. Obviously, I did not put in much thought into what those parameters would be. Obviously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so right. this is a very common thing that comes up in any modeling and simulation group, and that is how do you know your model represents the real thing? So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go to this parameter estimation. I've actually already got it open in the background, but under the analysis tab in 12B, it's under the tools menu prior to 12B, you get to parameter estimation, and that pops up this user interface here. So the point of this is we're going to use 
this is an interface that allows us to use the MATLAB optimization toolbox in Simulink to tune the parameters of the model so the output of the model matches the output from the real motor. So what I've done here is I've imported that data from a MATLAB workspace. If I click plot, um, now this is actually the red dashed line in the previous plot. This is the real hardware data that's that I just imported. Yes, that's our measurement. Okay, I'm just plotting it out here. And if I go to my estimation, you can see that I've got one data set best practice is to use many as well as other ones for validation. I've got one output, so I'm just weighting it as a value of one, but you could have multiple outputs. I choose the parameters I'm trying to determine with that set of data, right? That I want to optimize the parameters uh, using that real data. And in this case, I've chosen all of the, all of the motor parameters that, that you... Except Genertia. Well, I didn't choose Genertia um, because I, we got that from the CAD model. And it's kind of, I'm, I'm saying I trust it for now. But Very these other ones, I, these are, you think you had 1, 1, 1, and 1. I have 1, 1, 10, and 0. 0.1, kind of trying to get the right order of magnitude, but still made up numbers. Good. So now I'll go to the estimation tab. Click the start button, and we'll see two plots that pop up, okay? And this is where it gets really interesting. Now, as it's running, you also notice that the scope here in the background, the simulate model, are running over and over and over again. Oh, I forgot to do something. I love these demos because it's just like real, real life, right? You run into errors. You guys run into errors. We run into errors, too. And it's because I need to switch back to the simulation version of the model. So I'm going to change it back to the simulate model, and I'm also going to change it back into normal mode. So it's running on your, your laptop again. Exactly. Simulation mode, not hardware interface mode. Okay, so let me click the start button again. And I think bring up the you can graphs. see that it's running in the background over and over and over again. We'll see two plots pop up. And this one on top, and I'm moving to the left, is the most interesting one to me because that shows the simulation data in blue, but that gray data is the data from the real hardware test that we just did that we imported into this, uh, into this interface, the parameter estimation interface. And on this plot on the right, what you'll see is actually iterations on the x-axis. And these four different plots are the four parameters that we're plotting. So I think that one's pretty cool, too, because we're going to get to see how all four of them change with each iteration. That's right. And, and what you're looking for is over time, now initially in the first iteration didn't change them, but what you'll see over time is they all start changing, they'll kind of start um, you know, asymptotically um, approaching a value and that's how we know we're getting close. But we're looking for the gap between these two curves to really kind of go away. There you see it got closer, it changed all four parameters simultaneously, the optimization toolbox. So is it using outline. like gradient methods or something, Sam? Uh, and you can choose any of the optimization methods or algorithms that are available from the optimization toolbox. We use the default, which actually is a gradient method. There okay. are other like global but methods. But gradients available. are good for yeah local minimums. There are global method, uh, me other methods for more global searches. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Well, so that's amazing. You know, this is what only your fourth iteration, and you're beginning to to really do well. It's doing great, and I, I'm really excited about this particular add-on for Simulink because I wasn't aware this existed before I came to work for the MathWorks five years ago. It's really neat stuff. Okay, so one thing that I'm a little bit worried about, Sam, is look at that first hump. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was kind of focused on these humps, Terry, because these are looking good. But you go right mm -hmm. to the to the heart of the matter, which is this first one, and that's not yeah, looking so good. Well, Sam, you know, uh, you know, I don't think it's your fault. I think it's my fault. Uh, I, w I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, I think uh, we put it together a model. I think you did add damping at least. I didn't even I did. have damping. But there is no friction. We believe that's because of friction. And if there is no friction, and especially no friction coefficients to be fit, there's no way we will be able to model friction. Right. So what this process made us aware of is the fact that there's some real dynamics of the system that we're not modeling, and therefore the optimizer couldn't tune any parameters to match that. It did the best it could. It's done now. Yes, that's the best fit, really, you can get for that formula. For that model, yes. Okay. Well, you know, what do you think? Is that good enough? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of control we're going to use with the motor. Um, why don't we give it a shot, and just like any, engi any real engineering problem, we might end up iterating again, but let's see where, where we can go with this. Okay, let's give it a shot. So, Terry, now that we have a... Uh, you know, model of the motor that we believe in that matches the real motor, a validated plant model, if you will. Let's, yeah. uh, let's use simulation to design a controller for that motor. I'm on it. I'm okay. on it, Sam. All right. Rock right. on, Terry. So <laughs> check out what I got here. So this is a feedback control system. Here's your motor with your parameters. Okay. Got a little PID controller. Got a command signal. I'm going to basically send it to 90 degrees. All right. Let's just go ahead and hit run. All right. Let's 
take a look and look Ooh. at that, Sam. Right on 90 degrees. Yeah, but uh, it's kind of <laughs> ringing there. I don't know. You know what they call that? They call that underdamped. Okay. And so it's something that we can fix. All right. And it's really kind of our choice of uh, the parameters for our PID. All right. So obviously, not much choice or much thought here. 110 for KPKIKD. What we got, though, with our PID block is this really interesting button. Oh, yeah. The, the I like to call button. that the, uh, the magic button. The, the, the handy-dandy magic tune button. All right. <laughs> so anyways, uh, it's linearizing the plant right now, and it's going to bring up a really interesting interface for designing this PID That's controller. That's smart. It figured all that out. You didn't even tell what the plant was. All right. So uh, here we are, Sam. So do you understand why we got this like, little stair step thing going on here? Yeah, you got the, the uh, discrete time on the controller. Okay, that's exactly it. Okay, and what we're looking at is a step response, all right? Where we were is this gray one. Yeah, so I like the gray and the blue. It's like a before and after. That's exactly what yeah. we got. Okay, and, uh, and so we're looking at a little bit, you know, kind of expanded scale. That's why it's not, you know, looking exactly like we saw before. Yeah, that's only one second. Okay, but what we see here is the blue value ref reflects new updates on KP, KI, KD, which we're showing right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so these were optimized based on an algorithm that basically optimizes these very kind of uh, classic metrics for any kind of control. You know, rise time, settling time, overshoot, and so forth. Gain margin, phase margin. Wow, I did all that for you. That's pretty smart. Did every bit for me. So uh, all I need to do is now just click on OK. All right. We'll click OK there too. You saw those values were in there. When I hit run now, see what happens. Bam. Boom. Okay. So, uh, anyways, Sam, there's your controller. I think I did it for you. Did Looks you pretty good in simulation, you know. In simulation, uh, I think you're implying something. But <laughs> let's anyways, start with the real motor. You know what? I think it's a great idea. It's always a great idea if you can test. So, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Okay. So, what do you got here, Sam? Well, this is the model that you aim emailed to me, Terry. Doesn't it look like it? No, it doesn't. There's, there's a couple of things I'm, I got some questions about. Yeah. Okay. Discrete PID controller. That act absolutely is what I, I uh, sent to you. Right. This is your controller. Okay. And uh, then you got a couple of loops here, and you got something called a smooth step as your command signal. Right. Right. So, so a step response is nice for doing control design. But when you run with real hardware, you really kind of want to smooth out those corners, those infinite derivatives you talked about, because potentially you could actually damage equipment. It's possible. Not okay. with the equipment we're using here today, but it's possible. I think that's perfect. And so you, that's the, my input. It's just a smooth step, okay? Okay. Uh, can you show the, uh, the block diagram? Okay, so uh, it makes sense to me now. I think you're going to actually show the commanded signal versus your measurement as well. Correct. So this is the control loop, this, this inner loop, if you will. This is really just kind of tracing the uh, commanded position back over here to the end where we can log the data as well as the feedback so we can look at them uh, both on the scope and also log the data with this out port so that we can look at the data when we're done using this plot result button. Okay, let's do it. So let's run it. So I've got an external mode. So I'm actually running this model with on XPC target in real time, closed loop real time to test out this controller. So I'm going to connect an external mode, which means when I hit the play button, it's actually doing a hardware test. So you can see... Okay, it's I've running on your blue box again, isn't right. it? Right. Now, I haven't hit, the play, haven't hit the run button yet, but you see the motor sitting here. Now, actually, the motor right now is at a position of 90 degrees. So as soon as I hit play, you'll see the motor turn back to zero degrees because that's the initial position. And then I'll turn it to, then the controller will drive it through that smooth step up to uh, the end position 90 degrees. So I'm going to hit play. Here we go. All right, there it is, reset to zero. You see the red blinking light, of course. Just let us know things are working. Smooth step up to 90 degrees. We can see the data on our scope. Very cool. So you're going to show me how good my control is. Now. Yeah, so this little button runs a few MATLAB commands. It's just a shortcut. But basically, it's going to download the data from the real-time machine into my MATLAB workspace and plot it out. Ooh. Ooh mm. that, Sam, that kind of sucks. Yeah, it does kind of suck. Okay, so it looks like I bet you we're not even within two or three degrees. I'm going to get you the best you can do, which you can see it's kind of trying to get rid of that air, but I'm going to go out all the way out here to the end at like 10 seconds, and let's see how you did. So it's not quite that bad. It's uh, maybe a degree, a little over a degree, probably less than a degree and a half if you were to average out that noisy potentiometer. Mm -hmm. Here's the 90-degree set point, and it's a little more than a degree. That's true. And, you know, depending on your requirements, you might think that's okay, but I can tell you, we have customers where hundredth of a degree isn't good enough. So absolutely. So it's likely this isn't real good. Well, what are we going to do about this, Terry? Well, I think we're going to need to fix it. Okay, and how? I think that you know we're we're showing how you use plant models to design controls. 
we designed a very perfect control for the plant model we had. We did leave out something, though. We talked about this earlier. And of course, it was the static friction. Yes. Okay? And so we're going to need to fix our plant model and uh, then design a new control. Let's do it. All right. Hey, Sam, uh, I got one more question, though. Sure. What are we going to do about that noisy potentiometer? Can we do anything? Oh, yeah, that looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So MATLAB and Simulink, they are fantastic at uh, doing things like filtering. So what, I'll tell you what, I'll go work on that. I'll work on a filter for that potentiometer, and then when uh, we do the next set of testing, I'll, uh, I'll include that with the test. Okay, I'll work on a better control. Sounds good. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so uh, Sam, I came up with a better model. I want to show you kind of the results first. Nice. All right, so here's your data that you took in red, and then the blue is what the uh, simulation is showing you. That's a much better fit, Terry. I like how you accounted for those, uh, like the, the first couple small humps there where right the here. static friction. Yeah, that looks yeah. really good. How'd That's you do that? Uh, well, let me show you. So I basically went to the model. I changed the model. And so uh, this will show you know, an ad another advantage of, um, oops, look under mask. Another advantage of using these physical modeling tools. So it looks completely different. And what we have basically here is an electric circuit schematic. I think that actually looks more clear. It's kind of easier to see what's going on there than right. the old model. That's another good reason for doing it. So uh, DC motor kind of lives in both the electrical domain as well as the mechanical. The electric circuit schematic is a little bit more familiar, and it probably makes sense. you got these plus-minus terminals and so forth. Well, on the mechanical side, you kind of got the case and you got the rod. I don't know if you can see real close. That's a C and that's an R. Well, I have a question. So yeah. uh, that block there in the middle, it says DC motor, and then you got another block over the rotational friction. Where did that DC, did you make, is that another block that you made, that DC motor block, just like you made one earlier? No, this one comes straight out of the Sim Electronics uh, component library. Oh, fantastic. Okay, and Sim Electronics, which is kind of based on this this you, this tool set called Simscape. Well, Simscape Simscape's got a really nice friction block, right? And so you'll see that kind of the parameterization now exposes some friction coefficients for us. And if you look on the help dialog, you'll kind of see the basis of this. Whoa! Right. So this essentially is our friction model. What we're looking at is kind of the torque that's exerted on that shaft by friction as a function of the shaft velocity. I have to say, Terry, that's pretty impressive. Click on that picture. I bet it'll get bigger. I bet it will, too, because that's you nice. told me it, it would. You know, and, I, and I, I'm looking at this going, that's a cool friction model. And I'm also thinking, that has way more information about friction than I ever wanted to know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I won't give you any more. The main thing I'll point out is there is a discontinuity that you deal with. That's the nonlinearity, right? That's a big nonlinearity, <laughs> all right? So uh, anyways, uh, that's what's enabled this really nice fit that we have, mm -hmm. okay? And now we have a plant model that will help us develop the right control. Have you done that already? I have, let me show it to you. Okay, so here's my new model, Sam. All right, and we'll get to the controller in a little bit, but. So you're using that DC motor uh, model you just showed me, right? Yeah, okay. E exactly. All right, and, and then you have a new controller for it in this model. Yeah, see that says detailed model. That means it's got friction in it. Okay. So I'm gonna just kinda show you the results. So let's hit run. Okay, and here are the results. All right, so what I want to show first, actually, is kind of the essence of the controller. All right, and there's a little bit to kind of how we design the algorithm, but we basically are, you know, supplying a voltage that ends up looking like this, okay? And uh, it's made up of really a couple of components. There's feed forward, there's error rejection, which is really our PID. The main thing is, if I have a condition of static friction, it's going to give me an extra half a volt. And we're going to use that as a parameter to tune this in a second. And oh, that's where all those fuzzy lines come from, the, uh, the noise-looking stuff up there. That's the little bo boost you give it when it's in static friction. That's mode. all about static friction okay. right there. Okay, all right. And uh, anyways, you'll see that in the kind of current comparison, we're still not doing real well. Yeah, it doesn't look too good there, Terry. Okay, well, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyways, let's tune this now, too. Okay, so anyways... Uh, actually, let me kind of do that again. All right, yeah, let's get into that controller. And you'll see that the error is really kind of being calculated with that summation junction coming yep. out here. Yep. I'm sending that error directly into a uh, custom bounds, and we're going to impose a constraint that we don't want it to exceed three degrees. And that's uh, just so that this will converge reasonably quick. You know, ideally, as we said, we'd like to get to less than maybe a tenth of a degree, and you'd use similar techniques, but it might take a little bit longer to... So isn't our block very similar to this custom bounds that allows you to specify things like rise time and overshoot, um, and that's settling time and all exactly. that sort of stuff? Exactly. Okay. Again, we're doing a little bit of an easier problem, but uh, just for the point of uh, demonstration. Very good. Okay. So, uh, 
I'll show you where we currently are. So we'll just kind of hit that run button and we'll see. Um, I think we're probably exceeding it by maybe 15 to 20 degrees. So you can see, yeah, probably about 25 degrees that we're off, right? And so we're going to click on this button to uh, get into our response optimization tool. Oh, so this is where you're going to use the MATLAB optimization toolbox now to actually tune the controller with the full nonlinear model. That's exactly what it is. We're optimizing in the time domain this time. Yeah, we were very, you know, we didn't go into the depth of uh, PID optimization, but that certainly makes use of linearization to get to frequency domain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to do an optimization here. Uh, I got our plot. It's going to show up here. We're going to see some kind of metrics as the optimization occurs. Mm -hmm. We'll show right here in a sec. Anyways, the uh, design variables this time, and it really is design, you know, that we are making some choices. We're not just trying to fit yeah. existing results. Well, there's the controller gains. Yeah, I see. So KD, the derivative gain, KP, all right, and then this voltage boost. Those are our parameters. Let's voltage boost was that little spiky one. That I pointed out that caused what looked like almost noise in the controller signal. Yeah, you know, and I think it, it looked like noise because the controller wasn't designed real well at that point either. Okay. So anyways, as we tune these gains and really get very close to kind of the behavior that we want out of the system, we'll, we'll but see. But that boost is made to compensate. Is, it is the uh, static friction compensation, correct? That, that is your technique. That for doing boost that. is the static friction compensation. Okay. Gives a little boost whenever yeah. it starts getting stuck. Yeah, exactly. We all need a little nudge every now and then. <laughs> okay, so this will probably take about a minute, and we're going to see how, um, well, we already have iterated down to less than 14 degrees. If you notice right here, you look at that, basically it just keeps on running that simulation, just like we saw with parameter estimation. It's doing like some steepest descent kind of thing. Yeah, so this, that's, this is interesting because when we did it earlier using uh, simulate design optimization, we were actually tuning the parameters of the plant to make the plant match the model with the real hardware data, right? Yes. So we're tuning plant parameters. Now we're using a different feature of the same tool to tune the controller gains. So it was plant design, now it's controller design. Same, exactly. same different parts of the same tool. Yeah, and uh, ultimately, you know what these are? These are our requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay. The black lines, essentially. With what's within the white there is uh, meeting requirements, and what's with outside that in the, that yellow kind of area, that's not meeting requirements. That's exactly. It's as simple as that. And with that, we have a design that seems to work. Very Let's nice. Run the simulation one more time. Okay, and we hit run, and you can see we're doing much better. Now, this still worries me, but sometimes things work out, you know, in the wash when you do testing. And so I want to hand it off to you now, Sam, and see how we really are doing. Okay, yeah. well, you know, it, you're oftentimes giving me these times to go do the hardware tests, and I'm thinking, you know, I got MATLAB. Why don't I just automate that testing? So I think that's what I'm going to show you next. I think automated testing is super important, and the way that you can do it with MATLAB and XPC targets great. Let's right. do it. Let's do it. So what do you got here, Sam? All right. So I've got the your controller model, and I put in a yeah. couple extra oh, things. Oh, hold on. What is that? What's that thing with, like, all the bumps right this after one? the... This Yeah. So I told you I was going to go work on a filter, so I've, I basically put in a filter block. This comes right out of our digital signal processing. Um, there's some filter blocks, and this is a filter implementation block for a digital filter design. Yeah, filters are really important to controls guys too, aren't they? They are, and anytime you do anything with hardware, you're always going to need filters. And I love this interface because I'm not really a filter guy. I know enough to be dangerous, but I know I wanted a low pass, and I know what frequency I wanted to pass and cut mm -hmm. off. And it basically, I hit this design filter button, and it did it for me. And Told essentially, they're like what, like Laplace transforms, like high order Laplace transforms. Um, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> okay. I mean, I've implemented filters with basically you're taking so many of the previous and you're adding gains on them, you know, like a Butterworth filter. Okay, that sort so of thing. All kinds it implements of it for you. That Yeah, there's all kinds of choices there, yeah. Okay, and if it works, go for it. That's right. Um, hey, before you get going, could you show me a little bit of that DC motor hardware interface? Sure. Yeah. So this is the, um, actually, let me kind of navigate this way. So. These are the blocks that I uh, use for the hardware interface. The blue blocks, 
uh, this is a setup block. These two blocks are actually, this one's for the analog input. Uh, okay. So this value coming in here has a value of the voltage that's on the pin associated with channel 2 on my I.O. card in the in the blue box, as you like to call it, my real-time machine. And this, these are the three channels we're using to drive the motor. Actually, two channels to drive the motor. Yeah, see, this is why I think it's super cool. You know, that I've been working with all these ideal sources. You've simply replaced sources with, you know, really connections Interfaces to hardware. Interfaces to real hardware. Yeah, exactly. That's, it's gorgeous, Sam. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cool. So what I want to do now is I want to test out the controller. But first, I want to show the interactivity that you get using this prototyping system known as XPC Target. So I'm going to go ahead and connect this model, which I've already built and downloaded on XPC Target. Click the play button. And as you can see, I've got two sources. One is my smooth step, and the other is the sine wave. So if I go over to my scope as I'm in external mode here, you can see I get this update. And you can see the magenta line is the commanded input, and the yellow is the... the um, the current feedback. So it looks like a bit of a lag to me there. It is, and I actually altered your motor a little bit. I mean, your controller. You had this feed forward voltage. Um, I don't even remember what your original value was, but I zeroed it out, all right? Yeah. I kept the units the same because you had whatever the value was and converted it basically into radians. Well, you know, that essentially is your back EMF gain or your back EMF constant. You know, the feed forward in this case is just balancing that back EMF voltage. What's neat is, even though I've zeroed it out, if I put it back to some other value, like let me just change it to value of 1, you can it changes the value of the gain on the real-time controller as it's running, and then boom, basically instantaneously, you can see the results on the scope. That is, that, again, that's awesome. And uh, you know, when you do a parameter like that, you know, what do you call that? Parameter tuning while you're running in real time. Okay. It's a big deal for real-time testing. Yes. I just doubled it, and you can actually see we'll actually get some lead and some more overshoot because we're kind of increasing that gain too far. Exactly. So rather than kind of interactively sitting here and you know trying different values and you know trying to figure out which one's going to work the best, let me just stop this model. And what I want to do now is use a script here to run the test. Now this test is first thing it's going to do is flip this switch, and it's going to use the smooth step again for the test. So you can go into MATLAB and basically. Switch, do that switch. Yes, I wrote a simple MATLAB script, and this MATLAB script really just does some setup stuff like switching that switch to use the smooth step, and at the end it just sets it back to the original value. So really the whole script is this for loop you can see from there to there. All right. So it looks like this tg.start, that's what kind of gets things going. That's, that's what, what runs 10. the sim, yep. And this set param command is actually what sets that feed forward gain, okay? And it's setting it according to i, which is the index for our loop. So I'm just looping through some values here cool. of the feed forward gain. This is kind of the heart, the meat of it. It's really just a few lines. All of this is data analysis. It's taking the difference, so basically an RMS value between command and feedback. And all of this is just plotting it out on a plot. So let's go ahead and hit the play button. Cool. Now, as I do that, you'll notice on the video over here, you'll see the motor moving, right? All right, so it just reset to zero, actually, for the second test. Now it's doing that smooth step up to 90 degrees, right? Resetting to zero for the third test. And as it's running the test, it's plotting the results on the screen. So we're getting a little bit more lead with each of these, and therefore you're getting closer... Uh uh, matching between blue and green. Exactly, closing that gap between the command and the feedback. Wow, that third one's really good. Actually, the fourth one's a very good too. Yeah, here's a. Uh, this is a gain, the feed forward gain of 1.2, and the uh, the um, the error as I calculated it uh, is the least of all four of kind these. Of like as you pointed out. squares fit or exactly it takes them. the different squares and sums it up, and then takes the square. Yeah, it's gonna. Yeah, let's look at the kind of end there, and let's see how we're doing. So it looks like wow. You know, I bet that's probably, I bet that's like within a tenth of a degree or so. Yeah, it looks really good, Terry. That's it looks like about a tenth of a degree off at most. And you can also see that that high frequency noise that we saw before is gone or at least greatly attenuated. Nice and job. It's much smoother. Nice job filtering it out. So anyways, how do you like this controller now? I'm liking it a lot at this point. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's actually a little bit better than, than what we saw in simulation even. Yeah, looks well, that's because I did the tuning with the real hardware. Okay, automated testing cool. with hardware. All right, so why don't we just kind of integrate this back into the full robot. I think we may need to do a little bit of control tuning to really kind of account for the fact that the loads will be different on each mode. Right, as the, as the robot moves, the inertia actually changes. It's not a constant inertia, so we need to tune for that. Exactly. Let's do it. Okay, so we've been doing all this work with the, uh, the subsystem of the single motor with basically no load. 
How are we going to how are we going to relate this back to the real robot, Terry? Yeah, really. The only load we've had has been the inertia of the shaft itself. Right. The real robot, the inertia is way more complex, and that's because the configuration changes as it does move, and hence the uh, the inertia loads will change too. And it's a much bigger load too. I mean, compared to just the inertia of the shaft. Yeah, and that's why sim mechanics is so important to this. So, mm -hmm. what we've done in this model is we've reintegrated the motors back into sim mechanics. Okay. And so, I'd like to kind of share the results of this. And so. Let's uh, just kind of hit the run button. I'll run it from here. Nice visualization. Yeah. Let's Whoa, that kind of bounced there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, let's look at it from this point of view. And let's run it again. It's not supposed to bounce, is it? I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> well, that's not the input signal is my yeah. point. Yeah, exactly. And I'll show you how bad this one actually was. And so we, what we've done, you brought up earlier, you know, that those requirements mm -hmm. that we, we, we met last time were easy. This one really kind of shows some step requirements and you'll see kind of an overshoots defined there. And we got some settling kind of defined by kind of these channels at the end, but clearly, you know, that blue is violating those requirements quite yeah, substantially. Yeah, again, the, the requirements are indicated by the black lines. What's within the white area is good what's in the outside that in the yellow area is no good right yeah let me see if i can bring up both of these at the same time where's the other one yeah okay so they're really you know we set this up you know on a trajectory that really tests two two of our degrees of freedom in both cases we're violating it pretty badly okay so instead of kind of going through the whole design optimization again you know that's essentially how we did this and i'm gonna just use one of our shortcut buttons and let's load in our final gains. Oh, so it's the same technique you used when you tuned that previous controller. It's just now you're doing it with the inertial loads. Or you did it before, and now you're showing us the results. Yeah, and really, you know, just for that same reason, you know, that we have a nonlinear system, and, uh, and hence we need to uh, optimize in the time domain. What, okay. Yeah, that looked much better. I saw it that time. Yeah, yeah let's check it out now. All right, so, uh, yeah, we're doing quite well now. Right. Very nice. We have something. We do have a design that meets requirements. And kind of my last thing I'll show here is if you go into our MATLAB workspace, and let's just kind of drag this a little bit. Uh, okay, bicep KPKI KD, kind of similar to what we're going to see for the forearm KPI KI KD, uh, but a little bit different. And again, let's see: one twenty-three four ninety-five. 1745 mm. and 477. So the point is, even though we have the same motors on those two different degrees of freedom, they have different loads, different inertia, variable inertia, and therefore they don't have the same controller gains. And hence a different mission, and therefore they need a different controller gains. Makes sense. All right. So anyways, when we wrap up. Okay. Let's, let's do a, qu a quick summary here. Let's do it. Hey, Sam. Hey, Terry. How you doing? Good. Hey, how, how's your friend doing here? He's doing pretty good. You know, he's moving along. Um, the error actually checked it, and it looks like what we saw in simulation. It's looking really good. All right. Very good. Well, Sam, it was a real pleasure working with you. I enjoyed it, Terry, a lot. All right. And you know what? That you know really made a difference for me. It was that efficient connection to the hardware. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And uh, XPC Target was just a terrific environment to work with. I agree. I've used it for many years, even years before I came to the MathWorks, and I think it's a fantastic tool to make it easy to go from Simulink directly into uh, trying it with hardware. So what do you <laughs> think of uh, model-based design? Well, you know, I, I, I saw some really powerful stuff here today. So, for example, I liked how uh, we were able to efficiently get to the design in simulation. Uh, sim mechanics, sim electronics, huge shortcut for both the mechanics and electronics with the motors. I agree. And the point is we did a lot of upfront work in simulation before we ever did anything with any hardware. Right? That's, that's the way to do it. It's very, Absolutely. very cheap and inexpensive and fast, isn't it? We're doing design with simulation or model-based design, as we like to call it. So could you maybe summarize for us uh, some of the tools we use to do this? Absolutely. Let me pull up a slide that shows that. Here we go. So we show this almost as in a control design format, but really we iterated at each of these steps. At the plant modeling step, we iterated by, first of all, pulling in from CAD. In our case, it was SolidWorks. We support other CAD as well. Not a MathWorks product, but we pulled that into Sim Mechanics. Yeah, that combination of SolidWorks and Sim Mechanics is pretty hot, isn't it? It's powerful. Yeah. Why redo what you've already done? Just yeah. pull it into Simulink. And so I kind of uh, threw Sim Power Systems into this list, too. And Why'd you do that? Well, you know, we worked with a DC motor. Most motors are AC. Uh. And if you're going to use uh, AC motor, Sim Power Systems has some great models that you can work with. Good point. We didn't show AC motors, but that is a good uh, toolbox add-on for AC motors. So what do you think of all that optimization? I think the optimization is cool. MATLAB is such a great 
a tool for doing optimization, we are able to take advantage of that in Simulink. And it's kind of neat how it kind of works in both the you know fitting of your plant model, but right. also in the design of your new system. So. Which is exactly why we have it on the slide under plant modeling and under control design, and it's in blue just to indicate those. That's actually the same the same products that we used in in both of those parts of the process. Now, with regard to testing, you know, a lot of it you made look so easy, but I know there were a few things that you were able to or needed to do, and I think code generation was one of them. It was part of it. It's kind of all behind the scenes. Uh, we didn't focus on the code itself in this webinar. We have other webinars that cover that. But there, you know, when I clicked the build button, it did actually generate code from the model, transferred it to XPC target so we could run it in real time. That's because these real time systems, they're kind of bare bones. They don't run Windows or anything. So uh, this really, machine here is not running Windows, not running DOS. No it's choice, our, but really do it with, with C code. Exactly. All right, perfect. So anyways, again, MATLAB and Simulink, that is the foundation for everything. Um, it was a real pleasure working on this one with you, too, Sam. I've enjoyed so, it. I've enjoyed showing anyways, this to many people around the world. And anyways, thank you, everybody, who, uh, who sat and attended and watched this video. We hope you really liked it. Thank you. All right. See ya. See ya.